Welcome back to Course Correction Radio. My name is Trey Harris. Thank you for joining me, and I'd just like to say thank you for joining us for our one-year anniversary celebration. So we've got a lot of exciting show planned for tonight. I cannot wait to get into this with you guys. But if you look back on the screen before we do that, I'd just like to give a shout-out to... Now you see TV, nystv.org. As you can see, it's up on the screen, right? Uh, let's see. Right there. Yeah. nystv.org. Use promo code CCR for your first month free. That is what is behind me back here on this handy dandy screen. And as you can see, you've got the Dark Covenant documentary. Really good documentary. I recommend you see it if you want a close up. Of what it looks like. That is it right there. Dark Covenant Secret of Secrets. You can find that on nystv.org. And if you use our promo code CCR. That's all caps CCR. You can get your first month free on us. So please take advantage of that deal. You'll be helping out the channel greatly. And what it does is it lets us help our friends at uh, NYSTV. Who if it wasn't for them. Course Correction Radio probably would not even exist. And that sounds hyperbolic, but it is the truth. So, um, what we're going to do is we're going to get right into the, um, we're going to get right into the teaching part of tonight's episode, but we are going to do some fun things. We're going to take a trip down memory lane at the end of this. We're going to look and see how far course correction radio has come in the past year and how much the father has blessed us and first of all i'd just like to say thank you to each and every one of you guys because if it wasn't for you course correction radio we would i mean don't get me wrong we i would put it out there just in case anybody came in the future but it is you guys every single one of you are the reason that I push myself and push myself to make sure that we have an episode out every single week because, quite frankly, I love interacting with you guys. I love putting this on, and I really look forward to being in the chat with you guys every single week. It is one of the highlights of my week. So, um, yesterday, last night on the Weekend News Bulletin, I told you we'd be looking at Liberty things that that liberty has to say and that's that's going to come up later in the show but um before we can understand liberty we have to understand this this is today's show as you saw in the title how to become born again the biblical way and what this is this is our likened unto moses podcast and for those of you who may not be familiar uh quite a few months ago we started a uh, what was originally the second season of the podcast. And what it is, is that's how it started out. It has morphed into so much more. This 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 second season just exploded and just became a bunch of different things. We're doing like four or five different shows now, and I love it. But um, anyway, what this started out as was a way that... Um, I wanted to explore going through the Gospels. This was really, an, it was impressed on me to explore the Gospels, but go through and find ways that Jesus is connected to Moses. What connects him to Moses? Because Deuteronomy chapter 18 makes it very clear that a prophet likened unto Moses would come and that the people would be required to listen to him. And if he did, if they did not, then the father would require it of him because it was the father's words that he would be speaking. And as we get into John, we're going to see more and more of how that relates. But uh, today, we're going to be looking at John chapter 3. And what we're going to be looking at is the conversation that Jesus had with Nicodemus. And what I have titled this first segment is The Mystery of Regeneration. The mystery of regeneration, yes. Um, not one of these uh, hocus-pocus, um, 
esoteric mysteries, but rather a mystery that was given that could only be revealed by God himself. I believe it was, when was it? We just did a show not long ago where we talked about how the word mystery literally means that it is something that could only be revealed by God. And I can't remember because we've got an exclusive show that's just on the website called the the Drive Home, and I believe it was on that. So if you guys are interested to check that out, you can go to coursecorrectionradio.com, um, and it should be on the homepage. It's one of the last episodes uploaded. Um, you can go through listen to those. Um, but um, what what um, what the word mysterion means is it is a mystery that. Um, Helps Word Study says it's not a mystery that can't be solved, but rather something that can only be revealed by God himself. And that's what we're going to be looking at. So when you hear the mystery of regeneration, understand that this was something that God planned to reveal, to make fully known, and that's what we're going to get into. So, sorry, I want to get some coffee. It's after midnight as I'm recording this, so... Let's see. Let's get right into it. We're going to come over here, and this is what we're going to do. So, John chapter 3. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. For no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is is spirit. So see, Jesus is talking in terms that Nicodemus doesn't understand, but we'll get more into that in just a minute. Verse 7, Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but cannot tell whence it cometh, and whither it goeth. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? And Jesus answered and said unto him, Art thou a master of Israel, and knowest not these things? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, We speak that we do know, and testify that we have seen, and ye receive not our witness. If I have told you of earthly things, and ye believe not, how shall ye believe if I tell you of heavenly things? And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent His not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son. And this is the condemnation that light is come into the world. And men loved darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For every one that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth the truth come to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest." that they are wrought in God. And after these things came Jesus and his, and his disciples into the land of Judea, and there he tarried with them and baptized. So that's where we're going to be spending most of our time today is uh, breaking down John chapter 3, verses 1 through 21. And we're going to get right into the first segment, the mystery of 
regeneration. Now, I'd like to start off like I frequently do on the like and unto Moses. And we're going to start with a... We're going to start with uh, a breakdown of the chapter with the insight from Alfred Edersham in his book, The Life and Times of Jesus the Messiah, because he makes some very fascinating connections um, that me personally, I would have never thought to connect. See, I think sometimes as um, American Bible readers, we get so distracted by the numbers of the chapters and verses that we forget that there's a single flowing story going on throughout the gospel. And what we have here is, if you remember, and it's been, goodness gracious, I think it's been over a month easily, probably close to two since we've done A Likened Unto Moses, but the last one we did was called uh, A House of Merchandise. And we looked at John chapter 2, where Jesus went into the temple and um, threw over the tables of the money changers and chased them about with a scourge. Now, understand, one of the things, one of the big things that Jesus did there was he talked about how he, they would tear down the temple and, and in three days he would build it back up. But he wasn't talking about the earthly physical temple. He was referring to his body. Now, that is all fresh in the minds of what is going on here. So let's just, this is one thing he says about that. We can only suggest the question, but the cleansing of the temple undoubtedly preceded the actual festive Paschal week, John chapter 2. To those who were in Jerusalem, it was a week such as never had been before, a week when they saw the signs which he did, and when stirred up by a strange impulse, they believed in his name as the Messiah, a milk faith, as Luther pithily calls it, which read on and required for its sustenance signs, and like a vision it passed with the thing seen. Not a faith to which the sign was only the finger post, but a faith of which the sign, not the thing signified, was the substance. A faith which dazzled the mental sight, but reached not down to the heart. And Jesus, who with heart-searching glance saw saw what was in man, who needed not any to tell him, but with immediateness knew all, did not commit himself to them, They were not like his first Galilean disciples, true of heart and in heart. The Messiah whom these found and and he whom those saw met different conceptions. The faith of Jerusalem sign seers would not have compassed what Galileans experienced. It would not have, they, it would not have understood nor endured. He goes on to say, this they approached the um the moral and spiritual through the miraculous now what he's doing is he's talking of the people of the new testament and in the culture of jesus they approached the, like we approach everything through a um you know we approach everything through a rational thought but these this is what it says they approach the moral and the spiritual through the miraculous. See, we kind of see them as two different things. We see, you know, we've got um, the we've got the the morality of it, but then we've got the miraculous. But these these people then, this is what they saw. They approached the moral and spiritual through the miraculous. We the miraculous through the moral and spiritual. See, so you see what I mean? So we um we see it kind of backwards from what they do. His presence, that one grand presence, is indeed ever the same. But God always adapts his teachings to to his teaching to our learning. Else it were not teaching at all, least of, least of all divine teaching. Only what carried it now to us is not the same as what carried it to them of old. It is no more the finger post of signs, but the finger of the Spirit. To them the miraculous was the expected that miraculous, which to us is also is so truly and divinely miraculous, just because it applies to all time, since it carries to us the moral, as to them the physical aspect of the miracle. In each case, divine reality divinely conveyed. 
It may therefore safely be asserted that the men of that time, that to the men of that time, no teaching of the new faith would have been real without the evidence of miracles. Men regarded all that was above their viewpoint of nature as supernatural. The idea of the miraculous would, by its constant recurrence, always and prominently suggest itself. Now keep in mind, because I know we're reading a lot, we're referring to the signs that Jesus gave, right? Because they always asked for a sign. Give us a sign. He said, the adulterous generation, I will give you no sign except that sign of the prophet Jonah, right? Now, why are we prefacing this? And what it is is because if you noticed it, in the uh, the discourse between Jesus and Nicodemus, Jesus gave a huge sign. But he had also just given one in the previous chapter when he said, tear down this temple and I shall rebuild it within three days. Talking about his body. Huge sign. So we're, we're, we're trying to stress, if you will, the importance of the fact that they would have expected a sign. This is what they were looking for. So other teachers also among the Jews at least claimed the power of doing miracles and were popularly credited with them. But what an obvious contrast between theirs and the signs which Jesus did. In thinking of this, it is necessary to remember that the Talmud and the New Testament alike embody teaching, um, embody teaching Jewish in its form and addressed to Jews and at least so far as the regards of the subject of miracles at periods not far apart, and brought still nearer by the singular theological conservatism of the people. If, with this in our minds, we recall some of the absurd rabbinic pretensions, I want to make sure we emphasize that because a lot of what the Messianic and the Hebrew Roots movement will do, they'll point you back to these rabbis like they've got some sort of esoteric truth that's been hidden for thousands of years. But what uh, what Mr. Edersham says here is rather, <clears throat> even though they were similar in their reach to the theological conservatism of the Jewish people, and it was to the Jewish people um, with the signs of Jesus, they actually pointed to the credibility of his coming in the name of God, whereas with the rabbis, and they had these absurd miracles, and this is what it says. We recall some of the absurd rabbinic pretensions to miracles, such as the creation of a calf by two rabbis every Sabbath Eve for their Sabbath meal. That is in Sanhedrin 65b, or the repulsive or the repulsive and in part blasphemous account of a series of prodigies in testimony of the subtleties of some great rabbi, and um, it gives an abbreviation I'm not familiar with. Uh, We are almost overwhelmed by the evidential force of the contrast between them and the signs which Jesus did. We seem to be in an entirely new world, and we can understand the conclusion at which every earnest and thoughtful mind must have been arriving in witnessing them that he was indeed a teacher from God. Such an observer was Nicodemus, one of the Pharisees and a member of the Jerusalem Sanhedrin. And as we gather from his mode of expression, and and what he was referring to there is, we know that thou art a teacher from God. His mode of expression, not he only, but others with him. From the gospel history, we know him to have been cautious by nature and education and timid of character. Yet, as in other cases, it was the greatest offense to his Jewish thinking, the cross, which at last brought him to the light of decision and the vigor of bold confession, John 19, 39. And this in itself would show the real character of his inquiry and the effect of what Jesus had first taught him. It is, at any rate, altogether rash to speak of the manner of his first approach to Christ, as most commentators have done. We can scarcely realize the difficulties which he had to overcome. It must have been a mighty power of conviction to break down prejudice so far as to lead this old Sanhedrin to acknowledge a Galilean untrained in the schools as a teacher come from God and to repair him for direction on perhaps the most delicate 
an important point in Jewish theology. With that first bold purgation of the temple, a deadly feud between Jesus and the Jewish authorities had begun, of which the sequel could not be doubtful. It was involved in that first encounter in the temple, and it needed not the experience and the wisdom of an aged Sanhedrist to forecast the end. Nevertheless, Nicodemus came. If this is evidence of his intense earnestness, so is the bearing of Jesus of his divine character and of the truth of the narrative, as he was not depressed by the resistance of the authorities, nor by the mild faith of the multitude. So he was not elated by the possibility of making such a convert as a member of the great Sanhedrin. There is no excitement, no undue reference, nor eager politeness, no compromise, nor attempted persuasiveness, not even accommodation, nor... On the other hand, is there assumed superiority, irony, or dogmatism? There is not even a reference to the miracles, the evidential power of which had wrought in his visitor the initial conviction that he was a teacher come from God. All calm, earnest, all is calm, earnest, dignified, if we may reverently say it, as became the God man in the humiliation of his personal teaching. To say that this is all un-Jewish were a mere truism. It is divine. No fabricated narrative would have invented such a scene, nor so represented the actors in it. It goes on to talk about, um, there was no need for Nicodemus to pass through the house, for an outside stair would have led to the upper room. It talks about this was most likely um, in a house of that, that either... Uh, it says it probably belonged to the Apostle John who was writing the record. I found that interesting. But there's there's so many great things. Guys, if you have not read this book, please read it. So let's see. We're going to get right into... I'm going to get right into this. Um, you know, they talk about the kingdom, the kingdom, the kingdom. Um, according to the Jewish view, this second birth was the consequence of having, because Jesus said, except a man be born again, he cannot, he cannot see the kingdom of God. According to Jewish view, this second birth was the consequence of having taken upon oneself the kingdom, not, as Jesus put it, the cause and condition of it. The proselyte had taken upon himself the kingdom and therefore was born anew, while Jesus put it that he must be born again in order to see the kingdom of God. So see, Jesus came teaching something opposite of the rabbinical mindset with the kingdom, see? And it's the same to this day. The, 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 the rabbinic mindset, the messianic mindset, the dispensational mindset, they're all waiting for the world to end and for a Messiah to come reign physically on the earth. And the only Messiah that's going to do that, the only Christ that's going to do that, is the Antichrist. Understand, there is no physical thousand-year reign. If you saw the show that we did with uh, Dan, Dan Badandi on Truth Radio Show, we talked about the deception that is the millennial reign. And understand, this is, it all goes back to John chapter 3. John chapter 3 starts to give us our understanding of the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. The two are interchangeable. So, um... Now, get this. This is, this is interesting. This is such a key point. It had... Uh, Judaism could not understand, or Judaism could understand a new relationship towards God and man and even the forgiveness of sins, but it had no conception of a moral renovation, a spiritual birth as the initial condition for reformation far less as that for seeing the kingdom of God. So understand, the Jewish mindset of the day in this, the Judaistic mind frame of the day had no concept of a regeneration, which is why this first segment is called the mystery of regeneration because it was something that Jesus brought with him. Now, there's clues hidden throughout the Bible that that is the case. But this was something that Jesus came to fully reveal. All right. 
What Nicodemus had seen of Jesus had not only shaken the confidence which his former views on these subjects had engendered him, but opened dim possibilities, the very suggestion of which filled him with uneasiness as to the past and vague hopes as to the future. And it, and so it ever is with us also when, like Nicodemus, we first arrive at the convictions that Jesus is the teacher come from God. Really? This is Jesus, the prophet, likened unto Moses. What he teaches is so entirely different from what Nicodemus or any of us could, from any other standpoint than that of Jesus, have learned or known concerning the kingdom and entrance into it. It is the opening of the door through which the grand presence will enter in. The kingdom is other. The entrance to it is other than you know or think. But to see the kingdom of God, to understand what means the absolute rule of God, the one high calling of our humanity, by which a man becomes a child of God to perceive this, not as an improvement upon our present state, but as the submission of heart, mind, and life to him as our divine king, an existence which is and which means proclaiming unto the world the kingship of God. This can only be learned from Christ and needs even for its perception a kinship of spirit. For that which is born of the spirit is spirit. To see it needs the birth from above. To enter it, the double baptismal birth of what John's baptism had meant and of what Christ's baptism was. Remember, John said, I come, I baptize you with water, but one will come whose, whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie who will baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. So there's two types of baptism there. You have the water baptism for the remission of sins. But then after that, and this is what we're going to get into here shortly in the second segment of the show. After that, what you have is the baptism of fire. Let's get into this because I'm already going later than I wanted to with this segment. All right. Let's see. But there was another world of being than that of which Nicodemus thought. The world was the kingdom of God, and it's essential contrarity to the kingdom of this world, whether in the general sense of that expression or even in the special Judaistic sense attaching to the kingdom of the Messiah. There was only one gate by which a man could pass into the kingdom of God, for that which was of the flesh could ever be only fleshly. But that kingdom was, uh, it says here a man might strive as did the Jews by outward conformity to become, but he would never attain to being. But that kingdom was spiritual. So understand the kingdom, Jesus' kingdom is spiritual. If it is a spiritual kingdom, how could it be on earth for a thousand years? It's completely contrary to the Bible. And anybody teaching it, you need to watch out. You are in danger, in danger of being in a place where the tares will be bundled one day. If you don't know what I'm talking about, look up the Doctrine of Christ, Season 4, the wheat and the tares. David and Jimmy explain it so well, and you'll have plenty of time to see that because we don't have time to get into it, unfortunately. But understand, anybody who teaches this is by default in danger of being bundled with the tares at the end time harvest. All right. So the kingdom was spiritual, and here a man must be in order to become how was he to attain this new being? The Baptist had pointed out in its negative aspect of repentance and putting away the old by his baptism of water. And when, and when he says negative, he doesn't mean that it's a bad thing, but what it is is you have the negative of it, the negative at, that you're a sinner. 
And so you're a sinner in need of repentance. It's the gospel, right? John is the John the Baptist is the first half of the gospel, and that's to understand that you're a sinner who has broken God's law, and you are therefore condemned to death by default, because Jesus said he that doesn't believe is condemned already. So now you're in need of a Savior, and this is what it says after that. So... Because the Baptist could, in his baptism, only convey the negative, not the positive aspect of it. And it needed the positive aspect, the being born from above in order to see the kingdom of God. You heard the voice of the Spirit who originated the new being, but the origination of that new being or its further development into all that it might and would become lay beyond man's observation." So I'm skipping around a little bit. Um, You know, it talks about seeing the kingdom of God. Hear the sound of the wind as it swept past. Uh, Heard its voice, but he neither knew whence it came nor whether it went. You heard the voice of the Spirit who originated the new being. You know, the Spirit of God hovered upon the face of the waters, right? So this was such a mystery. And talks about how. This was such a mystery Unthought and unimagined in Jewish theology was a terribly sad manifestation of what the teacher in Israel was. Yet, it had all been told them. As of a personal knowledge, by the Baptist and by Jesus, nay, if they could have only received it by the whole Old Testament. He wanted to know how of these things before he believed them. He believed them not, though they had passed on earth, because he knew not their how. To that spring of being no one could ascend, but he that had come down from heaven, and who to bring to us that spring of being, had appeared as the Son of Man, the ideal man, the embodiment of the kingdom of heaven, and thus the only teacher, the only true teacher come from God. You ready for this? Here's where, here's where we get into our Moses stuff. Or did Nicodemus think of another teacher? Here they're two, their only teacher, Moses, whom Jewish tradition generally believed to have ascended into the very heavens in order to bring the teaching unto them. Let the history of Moses then teach them. They thought they understood his teaching, but there was one symbol in the history of which the tradition literally stood dumb. They had heard that Moses had taught them. They had seen the earthly things of God in the manna, which had rained from heaven. And in the hearing of it, they had not believed, but murmured and rebelled. They came to the judgment of fiery serpents in and in answer to repentant prayer. By the way, that word fiery serpents is seraphim. The symbol, and, and, and in answer to her print, repentant prayer, the symbol of new life, of new being, a life restored from death, and they looked on their no longer living but dead death lifted up before them. Assemble this, showing forth two elements. Negatively, the putting away of the past in their dead death. The serpent, no longer living, but a brazen serpent. And positively, in their look of faith and hope, before this symbol, as has been said, tradition has stood dumb. It could only suggest one meaning and draw from it one lesson. Both these were true, and yet both insufficient. The meaning which tradition attached to it was that Israel lifted up their eyes, not merely to the serpent, but rather to their Father in heaven, as regarded his mercy. This, as St. John afterwards shows in verse 16, was a true interpretation. But it left wholly out of their sight the anti- and the antitype. In gazing on whom our hearts are lifted up to the love of God, who gave his only begotten Son, and that we learn to know and love the Father in his Son. And the lesson which tradition drew from it was that this symbol taught the dead would live again, for it argued as it it is argued. Behold, if God made it through the similitude of the serpent which brought death, the dying should be restored to life. How much more shall he who is life 
restore the dead to life. And here lies the true interpretation of what Jesus taught. If the uplifted serpent as symbol brought life to the believing, look, the life to the believing look, which was fixed upon the giving, pardoning the love of God, then in the truest sense shall the uplifted son of man give true life to everyone that believeth, looking up in him to the giving and forgiving love of God, which his son came to bring to declare and to manifest. We're going to stop this right there, and we're going to go to our first break. We will be right back on Course Correction Radio. Don't go anywhere. All right. Thank you guys for holding on. Um, just wanted to get a few things situated real quick before we went in. So actually, there's a few things I've got to cover um, just to help the second. And um, really, there was a second and a third segment, but it's there's so much here. It's more like it's turning into four segments. So we're going to kind of mix the latter half of segment one that I didn't get to with segment two. And then I'm going to cut out segment three altogether. Just because there's things on segment three that I think you guys um, are probably familiar with. And if you're not, I'll leave the scriptures for those in the show notes below. That way you guys can have them because we're just, we're not going to have time to get into that. We're already 40 minutes in and that's just a quarter of what, I had planned to talk about plus 
the the anniversary special stuff. So, um, really, so uh, one of the things that needs to be understood when we're looking at this is the fact that Jesus talked about lifting up the serpent on the pole, and that's what we talked about. The serpent represented, they could look at the defeated serpent and see that they could be healed from their infirmities, right? Well, we have the infirmity of sin. And we know that Jesus hung on the cross and defeated sin and that all we need to do is ask forgiveness of our sins, repent and turn away from that, believe in the gift of Christ offered on the cross, and we can be born again, as Jesus said, right? We just read that. But here's the interesting thing is the common theme for the serpent and the king face going off face to face because Genesis 3.15 talks about bruising the heel and then the, the, the him bruising the head of the serpent. And understand that is one of the types that this is pointing to. See, Jesus defeated the serpent at the cross, at least bruised his head. Now, we know that deadly head wound is going to heal in the end days, uh, the Doctrine of Christ has a great episode on that, so I'll try to find that and link that in the show notes below as well. Now, here's what I wanted to get into, so let's do a quick comparison real quick so we can fully understand this mystery of regeneration. So in John chapter 3, and I'm not going to pull this up for time, so like I said, I'll have all these verses listed in the show notes. John chapter 3, verse 3, Jesus said, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And so if you flip over to Galatians 6.15, it says this. So we're comparing it to verily, verily, I say unto thee, unless a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Galatians 3, 6, 15, for in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creature, and as many as walk according to to this rule, peace be on them, and mercy, and upon the, and upon the Israel of God. For henceforth let no man trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. Brethren, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be in you, be with your spirit. Amen. So, this is what this is what uh, um, Edersham was talking about that outward conformity that they could try to do, but it's an inward spiritual rejuvenation that needs to happen, and that's what Paul's saying. You have to become a new creature. It's literally a rebirth, a genetic rebirth. I mean, you are literally you're going to be when you when you repent and you give your life to Christ. One of the things we we ask as believers is for is for the Father to cleanse us of our iniquity, and that is where there is that. So this is the next one when we look at that. Let's look at John, or excuse me, Titus 3.5, and this is what Titus 3.5 says. If I can get over there, goodness gracious. Titus 3.5, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Christ Jesus, or Jesus through Jesus Christ, our Savior, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. So that's Titus 3, 5. It's not by our works, but rather by the grace of Jesus Christ. So check this out. James 1.18 says this. James 1.18. Or of his own will... Or of his own will begat he us with the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Now, this is why I wanted to pull this one up because if you go to um, 
the book of Revelation. We're going to be getting into Revelation. You can get into Revelation a lot when looking at this study because Revelation talks about the serpent as well. So that's when we see the, the climax of that. So let's see. This is the 12,000 sealed from each tribe. And after these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor any on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God, and he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the fo- servants of our God in their foreheads. And I numbered, and I heard the number of them which were sealed, and were, and there were sealed an hundred and forty-four thousand of all the tribes of the children of Israel. And so, um, that was actually not the part I was looking for, but there is a part where it talks about these are the first fruits. Let's see. Hmm. Well, if I find it, I'll link it below, but there's a place in the book of Revelation where it talks about that, but we're just going to have to keep going from time. So 1 Peter 1, 23 says this. First Peter 1, 23, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. 1 Corinthians 15, 57, or 50, 1 Corinthians 15, 50 through 58 says this. All right. Now this I say, brethren, that the flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I shew you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. So that this corruptible shall have put on incorruption and this mortal shall have put on immortality. Then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that ye that your labor is not in vain in the Lord." So Paul says he show you a mystery that we shall not all sleep. Now we talk about, um, you know, the dead in Christ shall rise, right? And they shall put on, um, how did he put it? Give me just a second. For the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. So this is one of the things I wanted to show you is the resurrection. So because the book of Revelation talks about two resurrections. But what people don't, for whatever reason, people don't realize that the book of Revelation is, um, it's it's a it's an apocalyptic book. It's very symbolic in its nature. This is what that says. Um, let's get right into this. So, this is uh, um, the book of life, right? And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead 
were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead that were with them. And they were judged, every man according to their works, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. So that means they've dead, they've died, they've been raised again, and there's another death. So get this, check this out. And I was just looking at this earlier. Now all of a sudden I can't find it anywhere. The beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before them. This is Revelation 19.20. With which he had deceived them that they had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped the image. These were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which the sword proceedeth out of his mouth. And all the fowls were filled with their flesh. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the... Key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand, and he laid hold of the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years and cast him into the bottomless pit. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them, and I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received their his mark upon their forehead or in their for, or in their hands and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years but the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished this is the first resurrection so understand if Jesus is reigning right now in his thousand year or millennial reign then that means that somebody has already resurrected at this point and what it is is it's when you are born again, you have had a spiritual rejuvenation, regeneration, resurrection. So this is what Colossians says. The book of Colossians spells this out in, in plain English or Greek or whatever um, language you speak. It's, it's preserved in your language. So... Of course, now I'm not going to be able to find it. This is what always happens. But we just talked about it like last week or the week before. What what it says is um, you were dead in trespasses and sins. And I can't believe I can't find it now. This is so frustrating. I had it written down, and I don't know what I did with it. But... You know, the Bible says that we were dead in trespasses and sin. So if we were dead, we've been brought back. So that's what we're going to get into. That's why I wanted to t- talk about all that, because that's the next segment, is what Paul had to say about this stuff in the book of Romans. And if you can see over here, you probably can't see because of the microphone, but I have this book brought out. This is The Cross and Your Salvation by... Let's see if you can see that. David Carrico. We're going to get into this a little bit. I haven't finished this yet. This is a book my wife and I are studying through together. So, The Cross and Your Salvation, verse-by-verse commentary on Romans 6, Romans 7, and Romans 8. But what I have gotten into so far, I'm digging it. Because... Romans 6 is, you know, we all know Romans 6. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin have any lo- live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him. 
by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. My friends, brothers and sisters, the first resurrection has already happened. If you have been reborn through the blood of Jesus Christ, you have partaken in the first resurrection. Now get this. We're going to make this plain. And we're going to read out of this commentary so we can show you. So this is it. The point this, this is on uh, verse 2. The point, God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live there any longer therein? Being dead to sin is a spiritual quality and state of being that begins the very moment that a person is born again. We must remember that in Scripture, death does not mean extinction, but always separation. This is what takes place when a person is reborn. There is a supernatural separation between them and their sinful nature. Skip a few lines down. It says, This supernatural separation that enables the Christian to be dead to the sin within them comes about as a result of the wonderful things that happen when regeneration happens takes place this includes the actual impartation of the divine nature of god into the christian and the holy ghost coming to dwell in the christian as his temple first peter or excuse me second peter 2 one uh sec, goodness gracious second peter chapter 1 verse 4 whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these ye might be partakers of the divine Nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And I've got a note here that I put, think Genesis 6, iniquity corrupts the genes. 1 Corinthians six nineteen through 20, what? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. And in your spirit, which are God's. After we say yes to Jesus by dying to sin, by continually placing our faith in the finished work of the cross, then and only then do we have the power to say no to sin. Verse 3. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized unto his death? This baptism of the Holy Spirit, the scripture is this scripture is not about being baptized in water, but just as the scripture states, it concerns being baptized into Jesus Christ. This happens when the Holy Spirit baptizes us into the body of Christ. First Corinthians twelve thirteen, for by one spirit we are all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free. And have all and have been all made to drink into one spirit. Verse four, we are baptized, uh, therefore we are buried with him in, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. We are baptized into the body of Christ by the Holy Spirit. We are buried with Jesus in his death. First Peter 2, 2. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby. When we believe that Jesus died on the cross for all of our sinless, subs, for all of us as our sinless substitute, excuse me, and when we accept his death for us, this is the complete payment for our sin debt, we reap the spiritual benefits of his death. This is, is what is meant by being buried with him. We die to sin because we place our faith in his death on the cross as the payment of our sin debt. It also holds true that just as the death of Jesus preceded and resulted in his resurrection, even so our death to sin results in us walking in newness of life because of the Holy Spirit that dwells in our hearts and we become the partaker of the divine nature of God. Now, does that mean 
that we become is this is this in any way advocating advocating for what is known as sinless perfectionism? Absolutely not, because this is what Paul goes on to say in Romans seven. Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that law hath dominion over a man as long as he lives. For the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth, but if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. So then, if while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also... Are, de- are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who raised who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. For when we were in the flesh, the, mo- the motions of sins, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. But now we are delivered from the law, that being dead, we were, by being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. So this is where you get a lot of wing nuts in the modern church saying, well, when you're raised in Christ, you, uh, you no longer have to follow the law. The law is, uh, the law has been done away with and, uh, you walk in newness of life now, even though earlier it just said in Romans, let's go back to Romans 6, 1. Let's refresh ourselves for these dum-dums that are in the pulpit now. All right, this is to you dum-dums that are in the pulpit that went and wasted thousands of dollars so you could not learn the Bible. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer? I don't I don't know where I don't know where these people get it, man. These people the, these these guys that are in these pulpits that teach that the law has been done away with, they're morons. I, I just don't know how else to put it. They're dummies. I mean, and like I don't mean that to be mean, but I mean, my gosh. They, so here's what's happened. They are literally under the delusion. They believe that that is what it is. So understand, when the Bible talks about a strong delusion, it's not one specific delusion. It is a delusionary mind state, and these guys are in it. Now, don't get me wrong. That delusionary mindset will lead to other delusions. In the end, these are the guys that if some fallen angels were to come as aliens, I'll be, oh, I guess it's true. I mean, these these guys are, they're, they're, they're about this close to being spiritually dead if they're not spiritually dead already. I, I hate to put it that way, but that's just the, that's just the truth. So understand that when we look at Romans 7, uh, verses 1 through 6 like this, this is what's happened. Paul says he's speaking to people that know the law. So if you don't know the law, he's probably not speaking to you because what he's talking about there is Deuteronomy chapter 24, which this is what it says. Let's read that real quick just so we can have some fresh perspective of what Paul is talking about. All right, Deuteronomy 24. When a man hath taken a wife and married her, and it come to pass that she find no favor in his eyes, because he hath found some uncleanness in her, then let him write her a bill of divorcement, and give it in her hand, and send her out of his house. And when she is departed out of his house, she may go and be another man's wife. And the latter husbands hate her, Right, and if the latter husband hate her and write her a bill of divorcement and giveth her into her hand and sendeth her out of his house, or if the latter husband die, which took her to be his wife, her former husband, which sent her away, may not take her again to be his wife. Now keep that in mind, because if you find, flip over to Jeremiah chapter 3, this is what we see. Man, I heard a, I heard a, a, a messianic rabbi. Man, he got hot over this. That said, this is the, so Jeremiah chapter 3. They say, if a man put away his wife and she go from him and become another man's, shall he return unto her again? Shall not the land be greatly polluted, but thou hast played the harlot with many lovers. He's talking to Israel here. 
Let's play the harlot with many lovers. Yet return again to me, saith the Lord. Lift up thine eyes unto the high places, and see where thou hast been, where thou hast not been lying with. In the ways hast in the ways hast thou sat for them, as the Arabian in the wilderness, and thou hast polluted the land with thy whoredoms. And with thy wickedness, so with thy whoredom. So, guys, who do you think the whore is in the last days? It's somebody who pledged allegiance to God but doesn't actually follow him. It's common sense. But, I mean, the whole time I was in the modern-day apostate church, I was like, I wonder what the whore of Babylon is. But you know why I didn't know? Because I didn't read my Bible. And I'm, I'm sorry, but I believe that 95% of today's Christians don't actually read their Bible. They can't because they don't follow it. Verse 3, there are showers, therefore showers have been withholden, and there have been no latter rain, and thou hast a whore's forehead. See, I find that verse interesting. Thou hast a whore's forehead, thou refusest to be ashamed. And it was written on her forehead, mystery, Babylon the great. See, I the, look, there's connections all over the Bible to this stuff. Let's skip to verse 8. And I saw when for all the causes whereby backsliding Israel committed adultery, I had put her away and given her a bill of divorce. Yet her treacherous sister Judah feared not, but went out and played the harlot also. So we have a connection here. If you don't know the law and the prophets, this is why Jesus said, Think not that I come to destroy the law and the prophets. I come not to destroy, but to fulfill. But yet these dummies in the pulpit don't understand it. Why? Because they don't actually read their whole Bible. They can't read their whole Bible. They're not capable of it because the wool has been pulled over their eyes. Seeing, they see not, and hearing, they hear not. It's because they don't understand the mystery of regeneration. That's what I'm trying to get at here. Understand that Jesus coming back and saying, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven except ye be born again, Let's, let's finish reading what Paul said because we've got to understand this. Guys, this is the mystery of regeneration explained by Paul right here in the book of Romans. And this is the gospel message, and so many people don't get it. So what did Paul say? Paul said, So then, if while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. So understand that Israel went off and worshipped the gods of Assyria and the gods of Ammon and all of these foreign gods, and that was a spiritual whoredom. It was spiritual adultery, and God wrote them a bill of divorce. We're talking about the ten northern tribes here. God wrote them a bill of divorce. But this is what he says after that. Wherefore, my brethren... Ye also are dead to the law, the law of divorce. There's a specific law here. It's not the whole law. I'm talking to you, pastors. Knock, knock. It's not the whole law. Wake up. Let's use our brains. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. By the way, the mind is connected to your soul biblically. So let's have a rejuvenation of the soul. Let's start using our minds to glorify God and realize that when we read the Bible in context, Paul is talking about one specific law here and it is the law of divorce talked about in deuteronomy 24 jeremiah chapter 3 are we all on the same page good let's go on that ye should be married to another even to him who is raised from the dead well who was raised from the dead jesus jesus is the bridegroom yes so the husband died and we have a death in him, so the husband and the bride is dead. Guess what happened? The ordinance. They were nailed to the cross. And we're talking about um, not the law, the condemnation that comes for breaking the law. The one that said, you can never come back. God, by dying on the cross and we dying in him, well, through Israel, because everybody's grafted in, right? We come in, we become the Israel of God, as it said in the passage we read earlier. We become the Israel of God, and guess what? We are back in. Even if you have no blood of Israel whatsoever, they were assimilated into the Gentiles anyway. 
So, and God was trying to prove a point there that it didn't matter. Everybody was welcome back in because it was you and the stranger who sojourns among you, right? So what happens is everybody is grafted back in, even though God had already said there's no way that you can come back, except for God had a loophole. And this is why it's the greatest story ever told. This is why it is the gospel, the good news, because God made a way through the blood of Jesus for that old covenant to be ripped up. And now he has a new, a better covenant, as the book of Hebrews says, for us to partake in. One where Jesus is the high priest and we are his priesthood. We are his temple and we go from there. So, but understand, to be the temple of God, one must be reborn because the kingdom of God is at hand and you cannot see the kingdom of God unless you be born again. So let's get into the part where we talked about is this sin, right? So when we talk about sinless perfectionism, it can't be. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law said, Thou shalt not covet. By sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. For without the law, sin was dead. And see, that is exactly what happened. So see, what they say there is, Sin is dead because we don't have the law. And so we're dead to sin, but they're, they're misinterpreting it. What happens is if you remove the law, there is no sin, and that is why there is so much lawlessness in the church today. I'm telling you, Jesus said, when the Son of Man returns, will he find faith on the earth? Look around you, folks. There ain't much left. And look, hey, I'm just as bad as the next guy sometimes. I'm not anything special. But I thank God that he has woke me up to this because every day I notice my sin more and more because the Holy Spirit is working through me and that all glory goes to God because it is nothing of myself. I cannot boast. I cannot boast. What's the difference? The difference is God has awakened me to my sin because of his law. I would not have known sin but by the law. Is it starting to make sense now? Because I don't know how much clearly I can explain it for those who don't already know. And most of you guys, you already know this, so I'm sorry that I'm ranting so much about this, but I've got to, hey, look, we cannot leave the sleeping brothers and sisters behind because if something happens to them, their blood is on our hands. So let's go on. For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. So we already talked about that, right? We talked about this death, death to sin, things like that. And the commandment which was ordained to life I found to be unto death. For sin taking occasion by the commandment deceived me and by it slew me. So what Paul is saying is he fell back into sin. Like he, look, he, he didn't, he wasn't perfect. He still struggled. For sin taking by occasion, for sin taking occasion by the commandment deceived me and by it slew me. Wherefore the law is holy. And the commandment, holy and just and good. Wake up, pastors who said that the law is done away with. You need to read the whole Bible and stop taking it out of context. Stop twisting the word of God and stop being a child of the devil. Because when you twist the Bible, you're being a child of the devil, and I'm going to call you out for it. I'm sick of it. Stop it. If you're not going to read the whole Bible, just go ahead and quit. Get out of that pulpit. You don't deserve it. Give it to somebody who actually cares about the word of God. Go dig a ditch or something. That's about all you're good for if you're not going to read the word of God in its entirety. I'm so sick of these apostate preachers. Ugh. Mm. All right, let's get back into it. For we know that, all right, that's not where we were. Verse 13. Was then that which is good... Made death unto me? God forbid. But sin, that it might appear sin, 
working death in me, by which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. So what is he saying? Paul is saying because of the law, he recognized his sin more. Does that make sense? He would not have known sin but by the law. So the more he gets to know God's law, the closer he gets to Jesus and wanting to follow his commandments more, it naturally makes him more observant to the sin that he has and that he struggles with because we're still in a fallen body. But because of the regeneration of our souls and our mind that is connected to our souls, be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, Romans chapter 12, he was able to know sin more. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would that I do not, but what I hate, that do I. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Why? Because it helps him realize the things he doesn't want to do are there. The law is a, is a teacher to us, right? He says in Galatians it is a schoolmaster. But the church doesn't want that. They just want to take the easy road of, of just following Jesus and nothing else. They don't even follow his commandments. All they do is they use Jesus as a get-out-of-jail-free card. Well, Jesus is going to be my ticket to heaven. Oh, my goodness. I'm telling you, I am so sick of the church in its present state. It is worthless. It is worthless. It's reprobate. It's nothing but the housing of devils. And has become so much like the synagogues of the first century, Judea. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would do, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. Now if I do that I would not, is it no more that I do it? But sin that dwelleth in me, I find then a law that when I do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. Understand Paul is contrasting two different laws here, right? Two different laws. Just like there were two trees in the garden, the tree of life or the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So which one do you think the, the, knowledge, the law of sin is? The knowledge of good and evil. It brings about death, right? But through the law of God, well, that points us to Jesus Christ, right? This is what the book of Hebrews tells us. That's what Jesus tells us in Luke 24. But that's how I know that these pastors, whether advertently or inadvertently, and look, I'm not saying that they hadn't at some point experienced. I don't know. That's beyond my pay grade. But what I do know is by saying that the law of God has been done away with, they're not serving God. They're serving the devil. And I don't care if they don't like me. Look, if, look, if that offends you, I'm sorry. Turn it off. Turn it off. Because you're not listening. So you're literally wasting the electricity that you're using to watch it. And, well, let's face it. Somebody that could want to watch it, that, that this could actually be beneficial to, let them do it. Because if you're not going to repent of your sins, I'm sorry, I don't want you watching my channel at that point. This is for people who want to who want to fellowship and want to grow and want to be like-minded. If you want to be that great, please join us. But if not, if this is just making you angry, that's okay. Just go ahead and leave. This may not be for you. But understand, I'm saying this because I care about you and... I want you to be in heaven one day. Not heaven as in like 
oh, the ethereal up in the clouds. But like when New Jerusalem comes and Israel is gathered from the four corners of the earth, I want you to be there. I want you to be there. And I don't want you to be the least in the kingdom, whatever that means. I don't know. But I do know I want you to be there. And I want us all to be there. And all together. And one accord. But you're not going to do that. If you keep telling people the law's been done away with, Jesus says, anybody who teaches uh, men to, uh, not, uh, uh, let's, let's read it. Matthew chapter 5. Whoever shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men to do so, he shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. This is after Jesus said, think not that I come to destroy the law and the prophets. Come not to destroy, but to fulfill. Are you really going to stand there and spit in the face of Jesus and say that he, 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 he didn't come to destroy the law and the prophets, but when he died on the cross, that destroyed him? Look, I don't think you're serving the same Jesus as me. I'm just going to go ahead and be honest. You can't. You're serving some idolatrous form of Jesus that you've constructed in your mind. Anyway... Let's get into Romans 8. Look what Romans 8, 1 says. There is now for, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Paul just talked about the flesh, right? What did he say? He said it right here in verse 18. For I know that in me, that is, in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. If you walk according to that no good thing of the flesh, there is going to be condemnation for you. But guess how you figure out the pathway to the real, true Christ Jesus? Through his law. Because then you realize that you have sin, and that that sin is in need of repentance and regeneration And that can only be found through the blood of Jesus Christ, repenting of your sins, turning away from them, dying to your sin nature, and walking after Jesus by walking in the Spirit. We're going to get into that here. So let's skip down. He said, verse 3, For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. Look, the law was never meant to save you. It couldn't do that. That was the problem with Israel was they thought it could. They thought they were okay because they were keeping the law, but it was never designed for that. It was designed to point towards the Savior who would one day come, who was prophesied way back in the book of Genesis in what is called the Proto-Evangelion or the first gospel to bruise the head of the serpent, which is why the serpent was on the pole which is why you could look up to it and be healed because it looked toward the day and I truly believe it was hung on a cross like that. And the serpent was wrapped around that part. They looked up on that cross that had a serpent on it and they could look and be healed because it was pointing toward the fact that one day Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, would be on that cross and he would bring about the power of, that could cleanse people of their sins and bring them into a newness of life. Verse 12, Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye live through the Spirit, do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not not received the spirit of the bondage of bondage again to fear but ye have received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry abba father the spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit the spirit that's capitalized that's the holy spirit bear witness with our spirit that we are the children of god and that the children then heirs heirs of god and joint heirs with christ If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. We read that in Revelation chapter 20, right? Those who were beheaded for the testimony of Jesus Christ got to reign with him a thousand years. Understand that when we suffer for Christ and we're willing to die for his name, when we do die 
and we take on those sufferings like these missionaries across the world that have literally died for their faith they are up in heaven they are up in heaven in the third heaven with God the Father right now right they were with Jesus reigning now and brothers and sisters that is the promise that we have to look forward to if we will just walk according to the spirit and be led by the spirit anticipation of glory verse 18 for i reckon that the sufferings this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us for the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of god for the creature was made subject to vanity not willingly but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption and to the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. Verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. For whom did he foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate them, he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. What shall we say then, what shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, he shall, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything? To the charge of God's elect. It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? Who condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that he is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us, who shall separate us from the love of Christ, shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword, as it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all of these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. In closing, I want to read you this out of Alfred Edersham's Bible History, Old Testament. And this is what it says. This is right out of the very first chapter. And this was, this was out of my reading today. This was beautiful. It now only remained to test man's obedience to God. So let's, let's back up a little bit. So he also laid in paradise the foundation of civil society by the institution of marriage and the family. And it says, compared to Mark 10, 6 and 9. It now only remained to test man's obedience to God and to prepare him for yet higher and greater privileges than those which he had already enjoyed. But evil was already in this world of ours, for Satan and his angels had rebelled against God. The scriptural account of man's trial is exceedingly brief and simple. We are told that the tree of the knowledge of good and evil had been placed in the midst of the garden, and of the fruit of this tree God forbade Adam to eat on pain of death. On the other hand, there was also the tree of life in the garden, probably a symbol and pledge of a higher life which we should have inherited if our first parents hadn't continued obedient to God, or had continued obedient to God, excuse me. The issue of this trial came only too soon. The tempter, under the form of a serpent, approached Eve. He denied the threatenings of God and deceived her as to the real consequences of eating the forbidden fruit. This followed by the enticement of her own senses led Eve first to eat 
and then to induce her husband to do likewise. Their sin had its immediate consequence. Excuse me, guys. Excuse me. So their sin had its immediate consequence. They had aimed to be as gods. And instead of absolutely submitting themselves to the command of the Lord, acted independently on him. And that is what the modern day church is doing now by saying that the law of God has been done away with. And now their eyes are indeed opened as the tempter had promised to know good and evil. But only in their own guilty knowledge of sin, which immediately prompted the wish to hide themselves from the presence of God. Thus their alienation and departure from God, the condemning voice of their conscience and their sorrow and shame gave evidence that the divine threatening had already been accomplished. In the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. The sentence of death, which God now pronounced on our first parents, extended both to their bodily and their spiritual nature, to their mortal and immortal part. In the day he sinned, man died in body, soul, and spirit. And because Adam, as the head of his race, represented the whole, and as through him we shall all have entered upon a very high and happy state of being, if he had remained obedient, so now the consequences of his disobedience have extended to us all. And as, quote, by one man sin entered the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men for that all have sinned. Nay, even creation itself, which had been placed under his dominion, was made through this fall subject to vanity, and came under the curse, as God said to Adam, Cursed is the ground for thy sake, and sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee. God, in his infinite mercy, did not leave man to perish in his sin. He was indeed driven from paradise, for which he was no longer fit. But before that, God had pronounced the curse upon his tempter, Satan, and had given man the precious promise that the seed of the woman should bruise the head of the serpent. That is, our blessed Savior, born of a woman, should redeem us from the power of sin and death through his own obedience, death, and resurrection. Even the labor of his hands to which man was now doomed was in the circumstances a boon. Therefore, when our first parents left the Garden of Eden, it was not without hope nor into outer darkness. They carried with them the promise of a redeemer, the assurance of of the final defeat of the great enemy, as well as the divine institution of a Sabbath on which to worship and the marriage bond by which to be joined together into families. Thus, the foundations of the Christian life in all its bearings were laid in paradise. There are still other points of practical interest to be gathered up. The descent of all mankind from our first parents determined our spiritual relationship In Adam, all have sinned and fallen. But on the other hand, it also determines our spiritual relationship to the Lord Jesus Christ as the second Adam, which rests on precisely the same grounds. For as we have borne the image of the earthly, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. And as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. For as one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. The descent of all mankind from one common stock has in times past been questioned by some, although Scripture expressly teaches that he has made one blood of one blood all nations for to dwell on the face of the earth. It is remarkable that this denial, of which certainly never was shared by most competent men of science, has quite lately been, as we may say, almost universally abandoned. Here, moreover, we meet the first time with that strange resemblance to the revealed religion, which makes heathenism so like and yet so unlike the religion of the Old Testament. As in the souls of man we see the ruins of what has been made 
or what has been before the fall, so in the legends and traditions of the various religions of antiquity, we see we recognize the echoes of what man had originally heard from the mouth of God. Not only one race, but all nations have in their traditions preserved some dim remembrance alike of an originally happy and holy state, a so-called golden age, in which the intercourse between heaven and earth was unbroken, and the subsequent sin and fall of mankind. Meanwhile, the grand primeval promise, the seed of the woman shall bruise the head of the serpent, would stand out as a beacon light to all mankind on their way burning brighter and brighter first in the promise to Shem next in the pro- and next in that to Abraham then in the prophecy of Jacob and so on through the types of the law to the promises of the prophets till the fullness of time the son of righteousness arose with healing under his wings i think we're going to cut that off there and I have originally was going to go into a anniversary thing, but I'll just make that a separate video. I'll post that tomorrow, and it'll go up Monday because I don't want to mar that ending. That was beautiful, and I'm going to leave it at that. Guys, I'm not sure if you saw it on the screen in the back, um, but we've had Now You See TV. TruthRadioShow.com, Shake and Wake Radio, and FOJC Radio. Guys, get this book from FOJC Radio, The Cross and Your Salvation. It's an excellent book, and you can find it right on FOJCRadio.com. Annie, I want to give a shout-out to Annie from Shake and Wake Radio. God bless you, and thank you for everything that you have done for Course Correction Radio and for my family. We love you dearly. And words cannot describe how much you mean to us here in the Harris household. I want to give a shout out to my friend Dan Badondi at TruthRadioShow.com. Most of you already know him and you support his channel. If you have not and you are sick of the lies of the mainstream media, go check out TruthRadioShow.com. That's news you can trust. Make sure you're checking out The Cutting Edge. You can get a morning show there Monday through Friday. And you can even see the Monday show early, live on Sunday nights. So guys, with that, we're going to end that there. And um, I did just want to give them a shout out. But remember the words that we said. Everything from the law through the prophets, even from creation, even in creation, the foundations of our faith were laid. And it all points back to the Son of Righteousness who came with healing in his wings. And what did he heal? He healed our very soul. And gave us that regeneration. Guys, we're going to cut it off there. And we will see you next time on Course Correction Radio. God bless and good night. 